So, um, yeah, I, am, uh, I live in Amsterdam. I'm originally from the U.S., and um, I live there with my husband and my two kids who came with me today, but they didn't really think this was cool enough to sit in on, so I think they're running around outside. <laughs> um, I've been doing web design professionally for about 15 years, and I'm currently a senior designer at Booking.com, where I do both design as well as HTML and CSS. <clears throat> One of the things that's fun about working there is seeing the rather creative um, photos and names that some properties have chosen for themselves. For instance, how would you like to stay in wrong place? <laughs> and of course, you can stay in hell or heaven, depending on the type of person that you are, I guess. And finally, there's Jesus. This is my favorite line from its property description. <laughs> that Jesus is a great guy. So these are just a few of the over 802,000 properties providing Booking with their own content for us to display. That content then has to be translated into 42 languages, as does all the other website content. And the prices that you see on this site are in one of 54 currencies. With this huge variation in content, I have to make sure that my designs can be incredibly flexible. For instance, if I have to design a component that includes the name of a property, that name might be as short as two characters, or as long as 109 characters, or anywhere in between. So my component has to be flexible enough to hold all the variations in an elegant way. In responsive web design, the challenge is that you never know how much space is available outside the component. Here, the problem is kind of the opposite, not knowing how much stuff is available inside the component. But in both cases, the question is the same. How big do I make this thing so that everything will fit nicely? In response to web design, you answer this question by picking a percentage, an M or REM value, or a viewport unit based on what will work well for that item and the others on the page the majority of the time. And these are all good relative units of measurement, but they're not perfect. They are still a decision that you are making ahead of time rather than a calculation made on the fly for an individual user's precise set of viewing conditions and the precise piece of content that they're viewing at that moment. They're always going to be your best guess at what will work well um, for the majority, but not necessarily the ideal for any one thing in particular. Now, don't get me wrong, I have nothing against using these units of measurement, of course. They are the units that I have chosen to use in my work um, whenever possible for the last 10 years, and I continue to use them. But any imposed unit of measurement is always going to be an approximation of the ideal. Flexbox is not the ideal either. It's a tool with strengths and limitations, just like any other. But it gets us closer to the ideal, because with it, we no longer have to set explicit dimensions at all. We can let the browser figure out um, what size is best based on the space available, the surrounding elements, and the content within. And we still get to tell the browser a starting size, a starting point for that size, um, to give it some guidance. But we're not laying down a law as we are with explicit dimensions, even relative ones. Let me give you an example of the difference between the two approaches. Here is the job search form from the Guardian site. It's a responsive uh, layout. They give all the fields percentage widths, including the select uh, menu and the button, and they change those percentages at different breakpoints. This is the widest version of the layout. And they didn't use Flexbox on it, as they do now for their main site. They still use floating here. So I decided to make a copy of it to see if I could improve it at all by adding Flexbox, just as an exercise for me, not because there's anything bad with how they're doing it currently. So I copied it. This is my copy. It uses floats and percentage widths as they do. And I used this as my starting point. And I then tried to see if there was anywhere where I could add Flexbox to make the um, form more responsive. And I found two opportunities for simple progressive enhancement. The first issue is that because the select menu is set to a percentage, not its content length, the menu text can sometimes be cut off. Also, the button can grow much wider than its text, which looks rather awkward, in my opinion. Even if you like it like that, the, um, which is fine, the point is that you can't control it. The viewport is controlling it, and sometimes it will be snug to its text, and sometimes not. The percentage sizing becomes kind of arbitrary. 
This is the problem with explicit dimensions. Now, I could fix it by tweaking the breakpoints and not changing the layout until I'm sure that the select menu content can fit. But this is unreliable. You can't always create a whole new set of breakpoints to accommodate one piece of content on one page out of your whole site. Also, it's dependent on all users having the same font size and on the content in that select menu never changing, neither of which I think are safe assumptions. This is the perfect case for Flexbox, because as I said, it lets you avoid explicit dimensions and use the flex property instead to control sizing. This tells the browser the starting size that you want to use, including the native content size, and whether the item can grow bigger or smaller than the size to fit the space available. So for the select menu and the button, I want them to stay at their content width exactly, not get bigger or smaller. So I don't want them to flex. With the text fields, I want them to stretch to take up whatever space is left after the select, the button, and all the margins have been accounted for. And I don't have to do any math to figure out what value this should be. I just tell them to flex and let the browser figure out the math. So I can also, at the same time that I do this, keep the percentage widths in place for non-supporting browsers and add these flex values on top as an enhancement. The second problem with the original that I wanted to fix is that there's a slight misalignment of the fields across the line, even though I set the same padding on all of them. This shows two different browsers. Again, I could fix this by adjusting all the paddings, um, but it is browser dependent, so it's really annoying, hard to get perfect. A more reliable and easier fix is to just turn on Flexbox for each field wrapper, because flex items across a row are equal height by default. So with its wrapper, a flex container, each field will stretch to match the tallest one on its line. So these two lines of CSS in pink fix the height mismatch in five seconds. And actually, you can write it as one line, because you can leave the second off. It's the default value. So although the visual effect isn't huge in this case, neither is the effort to polish up this form. None of the Flexbox changes that I made to the form have to be hidden from older browsers. They simply override existing properties in browsers that understand them, which makes it really easy to progressively enhance this form. IE9 and earlier will see the top version, which looks a bit different but is still usable, and just about everyone else will see the bottom version. I think this enhancement is worthwhile to add because even though the Flexbox form does use the same breakpoints as the Float original, the fields inside are more responsive to their content. So overall, the layout of the fields looks more proportional inside each of these breakpoints. Content-driven breakpoints are better than device size breakpoints, but they are still a decision that you're um, making based on what is best for, hopefully, the majority of your content, but not every component or piece of content on every page at every moment. Flexbox can enhance your components to be more responsive within your breakpoints. The job form was just a demo, but we do use Flexbox in a similar way live at booking.com on our customer service form, which uses a fluid responsive layout. Using Flex, the fields fill the full width of their container, no matter its size, switching from stacked to two by two automatically as soon as they can fit um, beside each other. And by automatically, I mean no media queries. This is all of the CSS that's needed to create those two layouts. There's no media queries um, because the browser figures out the breakpoint for you using Flexbox. The Flex property, again, is simply an enhancement on top of the floating and the percentage uh, width that control the layout of the form when Flexbox isn't available. <clears throat> so the starter non-Flexbox version of the uh, form layout seen in IE 7 through 9 it has the same two layouts. They just don't stretch to be full width. But I think that this small difference is an acceptable trade-off for being able to write just a few lines of CSS, no media queries, and being completely done with laying out an entire responsive form. Let me walk you through how this CSS works. So first, um, we turn on Flexbox using Display Flex on the container. That turns the form into a Flex container and the child fields into Flex items. By default, this puts the items horizontally on a single row, but flex wrap wrap allows them to wrap onto multiple rows as needed. So if I didn't have flex wrap wrap set, um, the fields would always stay on run one row no matter what, even if content has to be cut off or they overflow out of their container. But with flex wrap, 
They will be stacked on narrow screens and then automatically switched to side by side when there's room for them to fit. It's similar to changing flex direction from column to row in a media query, but without needing any media query. So the breakpoint can happen automatically in a more natural spot with less CSS. So the fields do say row orientation the whole time. It's just that they may fo form up to four rows when the viewport is narrow, which then looks like one column. So then the question is, what makes them decide to wrap? The browser wraps them when it can't fit them on one line, but how does it know they can't fit at a certain point? This is where their flex values come in. So let me define the flex property first before explaining this particular value of the property. So the flex property is set on flex items to assign them a proportional size. It affects either their width or their height, whichever is the main size. And that's the dimension along the main axis. So the main axis is simply the um, set by flex direction. So flex direction is set to row. My main axis is horizontal. And width is my main size. If flex direction is set to column, my main axis is vertical. And height is my main size. And there's up to three components to a flex value, as it's a shorthand property. Flex grow means how much the flex item will grow relative to other items if there's extra space available. Flex shrink means how much the item will shrink relative to others if there's not enough space. And both flex grow and flex shrink are set to unitless integers, like 0, 1, 2, since they are specifying a proportion, not an absolute value. It's like the number of shares of extra space that they get. Flex basis is the initial starting dimension before free space is added on or taken away from the item. And it's set to any standard width or height value, including auto, which basically sizes the item according to its content. For example, on the booking.com customer service form, flex basis is set to 40%. Um, <clears throat> so that's the starting point. Uh, each field will be 40% of the width of its container. Um, and then the browser looks at the flex grow and flex shrink values to decide whether to get bigger or smaller than the flex basis value. Flex shrink, the second value set to zero, doesn't let the field shrink smaller than 40%. Effectively, this means that the most we can ever have on a line together is two, right? Because three or four 40% wide items are never going to fit on a line together. So that's why the form only gets to, um, into a two by two layout at its widest. Flex grow, the first value set to one, means that each field will get one share of any available extra width on a line. And this is what ensures that the form is always full width, because it um, tells each field to stretch to take up whatever space is left over after the 40% flex basis and the pixel margin and padding have been accounted for. So basically what happens is when the viewport gets narrow, the combination of the percentage flex basis size and the pixel margin and padding makes two inputs add up to more than 100%, which forces them to wrap and stack. The same thing happens with the float version. This is not a new sort of layout behavior. But with the flex value as an enhancement, the flex grow piece of that value, flex grow set to one, ensures that when the wrap happens, each field stretches to fill the width perfectly rather than remaining 40% wide. And again, Flexbox overrides the floating and the width values automatically. So the flex property can be added on to the same rule without having to hide anything from non-supporting browsers. So three extra lines of Flexbox CSS made this form much more responsive to the space available, and all without having to use a media query. Another place on Booking.com where we change the layout without a media query is within the map info windows that show when you click on a marker. I had the task to add a message about the room price that you see being almost sold out. And the logical place to put it seemed to be next to the price, especially since there's often a big gap there. And this is what that would look like. The price and the message are visually connected, and the message kind of leads you to the, the call to action button. So I like this. But the problem is that there is not always a big gap there. Rack rate pricing, long languages, long currencies can all take up a lot of space. In this case, this is due to variable content. But the same issue applies in responsive web design, of course, where the width that you have available in varies. Um, 
that you have some, uh, sorry, the width that you have available to put something in varies as the viewport width changes size. So in both cases, I have the problem of wanting to put something in a spot, but not being sure if that spot is always big enough. What I would like to happen is that the text sits beside the price if there's enough room, and then when the space shrinks below some minimum width that I set, it drops down onto the following line, and then it stretches to take up the full width. Now, without an explicit width on the availability message, the red text, making it float or inline block will not let its text wrap. So this first image with the red text wrapping could not happen. The text would want to stay all in one line, and so it would always drop below the price. Table cell will let the text wrap within that area, but it won't let the entire block wrap down below the price when there's not enough room um, or when the space is just too narrow for that text to look good there. So this second image with the red text below couldn't happen. So that leaves Flexbox, which is kind of like the best of both worlds, and lets me have both of these languages with one piece of CSS, or both of these layouts with one you know, piece of CSS. So I get the stretch and squish behavior of table cell, um, but it lets the boxes wrap if, um, if I tell it to, and if it needs to, based on the space available. And again, it does this without media queries. So IE7, 8, and 9 users will simply see the avail availability message always below the price, which doesn't look bad or broken. The few line of lines of Flexbox code are then layered on top as an enhancement for the vast majority of users. And Flexbox is great for this sort of micro layout stuff, managing the sizing and spacing of items within a component or module. You can use Flexbox in a similar way in responsive designs where you have a component that sometimes has room for its sub-items to sit side by side and sometimes needs them to stack without you having to figure out at what point that happens. Another example of how Flexbox can handle wrapping more elegantly is in what we call the mini info windows on our maps that show when you hover over a marker. I use Flexbox to lay out the review score and the price on opposite sides of the same line. Again, I couldn't give either of these two blocks a width, even in a relative unit of measurement, because the length of the content in each can vary wildly. Without set widths, um, inline block would not move the price, um, the price block to the right side, so that was out. Table cell worked fine without set widths, but if the content was long, the two pieces could overlap instead of the second block wrapping to a new line, which would be completely unacceptable. That left floating and Flexbox as my layout options. Floating worked, but when the content was long and the price wrapped to a second line, as in this screenshot down here with the long German words, <laughs> um, it would stay right aligned, which looks awkward. So I decided to use both, float for older browsers, and then I overrode it with Flexbox, which lets the text wrap to the left edge um, more elegantly. I didn't have to use Modernizer and hide pieces of CSS from certain browsers. Flexbox just takes over if the browser understands it. So no matter what, the two blocks will appear side by side in all browsers, and they will wrap when needed. The wrapping and alignment of the text just isn't quite as nice looking in non-Flexbox browsers. But that was going to happen whether or not I added Flexbox here. Um, I made a demo uh, to show you how this improved wrapping behavior can come in handy on responsive sites specifically. This article header uses Flexbox as an enhancement on top of display table cell to lay out and align its various chunks of content. Um, and it switches the layout automatically without a media query. This header block is basically a, a media block UI pattern that you see everywhere, right? With an image plus a block of text associated with it. Except here, the text portion stretches to fill the whole width and the whole height available, thanks to flex on the category, the green block, and align content on the multiple rows. Using flex to push the date to the opposite side is a great enhancement for what happens when there's not enough room to fit both the category and the date on the same line, such as when the viewport is very narrow, or the content is very long, or both. There's lots of ways to align content to opposite sides of a line with the 
old existing CSS that we've had forever. But if I used floating or text align to push the date to the right side, when the date needed to wrap, it would wrap down to the right edge, just like in the mini info windows on the maps, which looks kind of weird. Using flex, instead, it wraps to the left side, which looks a lot more natural. Um, this is not the only alignment enhancement that Flexbox can accomplish that no other CSS can produce. I briefly showed you the align content property on this, this header, but there are two other Flexbox alignment properties that allow you to align content in new ways really simply, which is invaluable in responsive designs where the content wraps differently at different viewport widths. For instance, Flexbox can distribute an unknown number of items across an, unknown, um, an area of unknown width or height, such as making a nav bar full width with equal spaces in between all of the links. If you wanted to make a nav bar like this, you'd probably first turn to display table cell. And you would be able to make the nav full width and um, have the first and last links at the edges. And you could even make each of the link boxes equal in width to each other if you used table layout fixed. But you would discover that you could not get equal spaces between the text block of each link. So if I do display table and table layout fixed on a UL, it makes each LI the same width. So they look equally spaced if they have backgrounds or borders. But remove the backgrounds and borders, and you see that the gaps, actual, um, the gaps between the actual links text is not equal. So longer links have smaller spaces around them. Shorter links have bigger spaces. But Flexbox can fix these unequal gaps really simply. Here is a simple nav bar from my Flexbox demo site, s'moresday.us. Um, for the starter layout, I used inline block to center the links in a row under the logo. They don't stretch full width, but there's nothing broken or wrong looking, and it works as a layout in, in the responsive page. But there's no reason why I can't add a few lines of Flexbox on top of this CSS to enhance the responsiveness of the nav further. I simply added these two lines of Flexbox in pink to the existing rules. The LI are still set to inline block, but now they're flex items too. So I can take advantage of these new um, alignment properties within Flexbox, such as justify content. Setting justify content to space between moves the first and last LI to the edges, and it equally distributes the space uh, remaining in between the other links. So using justify content space between, here is how the nav then looks on medium width screens. The links stretch out in the Flexbox version, and they remain centered in the non-Flexbox browsers. Now having the nav filling the full width looks great on medium width screens like this. But on really wide screens, it starts looking too stretched out. I wanted to make it more responsive to this extra space. So I decided to use Flexbox to pin the first two links to the left side of the logo and the last two links to the right side of the logo. Again, a pretty common responsive uh, nav layout. To do this, I first added a media query for wide screens. So you do sometimes need to still use media queries with Flexbox. And I also added a link to the modernizer script, because I need to feed some styles to only Flexbox browsers in this particular case, as you'll see in just a minute. Much of the time, Flexbox and fallback styles can coexist, as they did with the medium width version of the nav bar that I just showed you. But occasionally, they'll conflict, and you'll only want to apply a certain property if Flexbox is in effect or not. And the modernizer script is perfect for this. It can detect whether the browser does or doesn't support Flexbox, and whether it supports an old version or the current version. And then it adds the appropriate classes to your HTML tag, which you can use to scope the rules in your CSS. If you don't like Modernizer and you want to keep the feature detection in your CSS, you can also use the at supports uh, rule to detect whether the browser supports Flexbox and feed rules only in that case to do something like this. So at supports and Modernizer are both good options for those rare cases when you do need to isolate your Flexbox styles from your other CSS. For my navbar here, I used Modernizer's Flexbox class to scope this new rule to only Flexbox browsers, where I want the nav to move up on the, to the same line as the logo. Non-supporting browsers will not use this rule, um, so they will still get the inline block centered nav beneath the logo. Only the Flexbox version of the nav will move up. 
Now, to move the last two links to the right side, I simply set margin left auto on the third link, um, the throw party link, again scoped to only Flexbox browsers. And the reason that this works is that in Flexbox, if you set a margin in the main axis to auto, it takes up all of the free space that's left um, in that line. So with margin left auto on the throw party link, the browser places all of the extra space in the line to its left side, effectively pushing it and all the stuff after it to the right edge. So I get the appearance of a split list without having to cheat and break it into two lists um, in the HTML, which is less accessible and robust, not so good for responsive web design, where I'm trying to keep my HTML the same at all uh, viewport widths. This is a simple nav bar, but thanks to a bit of Flexbox, it can make full use of the changing width. Flexbox increases its responsiveness as an enhancement where available. Flexbox is not only a great way to make better use of the changing widths in a responsive layout, but also to make better use of the changing heights. So as the viewport changes width, your content wraps differently, so you can't count on constant heights for your content blocks. Flexbox can enhance the appearance of this variable height because it works in any direction. So let's say that I want to sh uh, show some social media sharing icons uh, down the side of each article or media object. And that media object content varies, as does the viewport width, which controls wrapping. So the height of each varies. And if I want to equally space the icons uh, vertically to take up the full height, I am out of luck. I cannot explicitly set each of them to height 33% because the parent media object has no explicitly set height itself to base these percentages off of. So a uh, percentage height value does nothing here. But I don't need the height property with Flexbox. First, I make the icon section and the content section flex items with the default horizontal row alignment. And I do this because I need them to be equal height. And sibling flex items are equal height by default, thanks to the line items property set to stretch by default. Um, you can't see it here because the icons are still top aligned within their section. But if the two sections had background colors, you would see that the icon section stretches to match the height of the content section. So now, the icon and the content section are equal height flex items, but the individual icon images are not flex items because only children of a flex container become flex items, not all descendants. But something can be both a flex item and a flex container. So that's what I do. I turn the icons section into a flex container. That makes its three ch children icon images into flex items. But this time, I set flex direction to column to stack them vertically from top to bottom. This doesn't change anything visually yet. They already were stacked vertically. But remember that flex direction also controls the main axis. With flex direction column, the icon's main axis is now vertical. So if I use justify content space between, to, um, it will equally space them over the main axis, which is the height, no matter how tall that is. And here's the result. Each media object has a different height, but the icons always span the full height with equal spaces in between. To make this work with non-Flexbox browsers, you can use whatever technique you normally would to get the icon block to sit next to the content block, such as display table cell or floating. Both of these can work um, and exist with Flexbox in the same CSS rules. Floating, uh, I mean, Flexbox just overrides uh, the float and table properties in browsers that understand it. And then in non-supporting browsers, your, the icons will be either top aligned um, with the text or vertically centered as a block. The browsers that don't support Flexbox have about 5% global market share. So a few users will see the non-Flexbox versions that I've shown you in these examples. But none of those versions look wrong or broken, just a little different, which is already happening all the time anyway. Flexbox is simply an enhancement to make better use of the space, especially between your breakpoints. It's not a true grid system. It wasn't designed to be. So it's not the best choice for your overall page layout. But it is a great choice for intelligently sizing um, and aligning components and smaller chunks of content within the major page, page sections. 
Flexbox also lets you visually rearrange content, which comes in handy, again, on responsive sites, where you're stuck with the same HTML order at all the sizes, but you want to shuffle content around on different views. And it's sometimes hard to make a block go where you want it to when you're tied to a certain source order. But Flexbox makes this easier. So remember the split nav bar? I used relative positioning and a negative top value to move the nav bar up, overlapping the same line as the logo, which is fine. But since the logo is not actually in the middle of the list, the links on either side of it can overlap it if the browser window gets too small. I avoid this with a media query. But if the logo was actually moved in the flow to the middle of the list, I wouldn't have to do this. But I don't want to move the logo in the middle of the list in the HTML, because on narrow screens, I still want it to come before the nav. With Flexbox, I can keep the logo in, uh, before the links in the HTML, but move it visually and in the flow to the middle using the order property. You set the order property on flex items to specify which order you want the browser to lay them out um, in their container, regardless of the HTML order. And the browser runs from the lowest numbers, including negative, to the highest. So you can think of it like assigning the items a position number in a line. The first two links I want to stay first, so they need the lowest order value. So I'll just leave them with the default of 0. The logo I want to be next, so it needs the next highest order value. I gave it 1. The last two links need to come after the logo, so they need the next highest order value. I gave them 2. So now that the logo is part of the line, not separate from it, it won't work to just have margin left auto on that uh, third link as before, because with every last bit of extra space in the line uh, put to its left, it will squish the logo over on the right side. To fix this, I can use two auto margins, and the browser will simply divide the extra space on the line evenly between the two um, items with those margins. So throw a party already has margin left auto from before, but I'll add, oh, sorry. I'll add the same to the logo. So half the extra space goes on the left side of the logo, half of it goes on the left side of the throw a party link, and thus the logo is moved to the center. Now, in order to make this work, I had to move the logo from outside the UL to inside at the same level as the other links. That's because order only works um, on siblings within the same flex container. You cannot move elements outside of their container to be before or after stuff that's outside the container. This does make it limiting. You have more source or order independence than current layout methods, um, but you still don't have complete freedom to move anything anywhere. This is perhaps a good thing, because you don't want to go crazy moving everything around with the order property. When you reorder content with Flexbox, you are only reordering it visually. It does not change the screen reading order or the tab order. So if the content that you're reordering contains text or tabbable content, make sure that the HTML order is logical first, and then use visual reordering um, only if it's just decorative and doesn't change the meaning of the content. Um, I'm running out of time, but let me quickly give you a simple example of accessible reordering with Flexbox. So on this recipe, the photo comes before the ingredients list in the HTML, so that on the wider view, I can float it beside the ingredients. And the narrow mobile view just stacks everything in the default HTML order. But I could use the Flexbox order property to move the photo from its HTML position before the ingredients to above the recipe title on mobile only. And in this case, this is not going to cause accessibility problems because there's no links in the photo to tab to, and there's no text in the photo to be read by screen readers, because I would give it null alt text, because the recipe itself provides a text alternative. So to move the photo, in the styles outside any media queries, I set flex direction to column to stack everything, and I set um, the order value of the image to negative 1. All the other flex items inside the recipe container have the default order value of 0. So negative 1 will move it to the top of the stack. And then on the desktop view, I simply turn off Flexbox by setting the recipe's display back to block. That puts the image back in the normal flow order, where I can then float it to the right. So there's no concern about Flexbox support on desktop, since I'm not using it there. And any mobile browsers that don't support it will simply see the image before the ingredients as normal. Um, I already showed you the Guardian's job search form, 
which doesn't use Flexbox, but their main site now does. And they use Flexbox to shuffle the stories around when you get to the wide view. Um, they actually don't use the order property to do this. Um, the Flexbox lets you run content not just top to bottom and left to right, but also bottom to top and right to left. So this is another clever way that Flexbox can improve responsiveness. So definitely go to their site and check out their CSS to learn more about the, um, their sort of reordering. I've shown you code for most of these examples, but I don't think that the code is the most important part of learning Flexbox. I think the biggest obstacle to getting started with it is not being able to picture how to use it because you're stuck thinking in terms of um, what was possible with floats and other old layout methods. It was the same when we switched from tables to CSS and from fix to fluid. Um, you had to make a mental shift to start thinking in terms of um, the new possibilities um, and approaches to old problems. Flexbox lets you do lots of things that you haven't been able to do before, and lots of things that you could do before, but now in an even simpler way. Once you see what Flexbox can do in the real world, you can start picturing how to use it in your own work to solve real responsive web design problems today. Um, <clears throat> Flexbox can be tricky to wrap your head around at first, but once you've learned it, it's an incredibly quick, cheap way for you to add more responsiveness to your components. And it may sound weird to talk about enhancing responsiveness, but I don't think that responsive web design is either on or off. Either your site is responsive or it's not. There's always more that you could do to make a responsive site even more responsive to the different user settings um, and the content within it. Flexbox is one of those things that you can do, as I hope you have seen with these examples. Don't be afraid to add Flexbox to your work, because Flexbox is not all or nothing. You, um, you don't need to use it. Uh, you don't need to use every single part of it to lay out every single thing on your site. You can keep using floats or table display or whatever it is you use to create layouts. Just add on Flexbox in one spot to add one little enhancement and see how it can improve responsiveness on your site. Thanks very much.